Sunday. I'm Trevor Phillips. You probably didn't expect to see me sitting in for Sophie this morning, but surprise, surprise, as Silla Black used to say. And frankly, there could be far bigger shocks before the day is out. Vladimir Putin probably didn't expect to wake up on his birthday weekend to see the bridge he opened to Crimea with a massive hole in it. What are you going to do about it? Liz Truss said she didn't mind being unpopular, but I don't suppose even she expected she'd have to drop one of her Chancellor's headline tax cuts, the abolition of the 45p rate. But it looks like she'll now have to quell a cabinet rebellion over whether benefits rise in line with inflation or earnings. Would she stand firm or buckle? Keir Starmer's probably rubbing his eyes in disbelief at an average poll lead of over 25%. That would hand him a stonking majority in a general election. But could the SNP leader, Nicola Sturgeon, put a span in the works on that one? Well, like all political journalists, I wish I had a crystal ball. I don't, but in the next 60 minutes, we'll do the next best thing, which is talk to the people who have to answer those questions. In a moment, I'll be joined by one of the most senior cabinet members, uh, Cabinet Office Minister Nadim Zahawi. Plus, for Labour, the Shadow Work and Pensions Secretary, Jonathan Ashworth. And just days before the SNP takes its case for a second Scottish referendum to the Supreme Court, we'll be speaking to the Cabinet Secretary for the Constitution, External Affairs and Culture, the SNP's Angus Robertson. The railways are getting back to normal this morning, but nurses are now balloting for strike action. I'll be speaking to the RCN General Secretary and Chief Executive, that's Pat Cullen. And as supermarkets offer one-pound hot meals and warm spaces to help people cope with rising energy bills, the former Sainsbury Chief Executive, Justin King, joins us. And joining me now is the Cabinet Office Minister, Nadim Zahawi. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, well, Minister. I... Um, now, you've written a newspaper article this morning um, calling on Conservative MPs to rally round Liz Truss. Did you expect that you'd have to be, within a month of her uh, election, you'd have to be begging your colleagues to give her a break? So I uh, wrote the article because I think... Uh, delay is our biggest enemy. We've got two years to demonstrate to the nation that we can deliver, deliver the growth plan, deliver the energy strategy that weans us off expensive oil and gas being imported to the United Kingdom by investing in nuclear, investing in offshore wind, onshore wind and, of course, other renewables. Uh, and I want my colleagues to obviously focus because, um, you know, any uh, dither or delay will end in defeat. And that's what we don't want to see. We want to be able to demonstrate to the nation, as we have done, first couple of days in office, Liz Truss put on, and I was Chancellor of the Exchequer who developed the plans, the biggest uh, energy package to protect households and businesses probably in history. Uh, is an enormous intervention to make sure that households can feel safe at Christmas, that they'll have the ability uh, to keep the heating on, whilst Putin, you mentioned Putin in your, in your opening um, uh, remarks, is using energy as a weapon against us because of the help we're putting into Ukraine and to get Ukraine, uh, their country back. So I, I, I understand that, but the thing that you really most apparently, I read the article, want to delay is Tory MPs criticising the Prime Minister. I Did you expect that you'd have to do that? Well, I want to see unity. I want us to, 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 now that we've had a leadership election, we've got a prime minister in place, we've got 24 months to deliver. The cabinet office is effectively, I'm the uh, chief operating officer of the government, the COO. My responsibility, um, Liz has given us the priorities for each department. So let me bring that to life for you. In health, it's about A, B, C, D. So ambulance, the backlog, care, then GPs and dentists, mm -hmm. doctors and dentists. If we deliver that in the next two years, where people feel confident they'll get their GP appointment within two weeks, hopefully even earlier, uh, they'll get a dentist appointment on the NHS, 
that we will actually finally deliver a care system that is fit for purpose, that people can see and feel the difference, I, uh, I, then we will, we will absolutely, I think, I, be I, I confident in going to the country and saying, give us another term. I want to give you a chance to talk about policy in a second, but let, let's just deal with the politics. Um, you're not the only ones taken to newspapers this morning. Um, Penny Mordaunt and Tuala Braverman, your cabinet colleagues, have written similar pieces. Um, could this be the same Penny Mordaunt who was the first to publicly disagree with the uh, policy of let's wait and see on inflation or earnings benefits? Or uh, could it be the same Suella Braverman who told a fringe meeting, second day of your conference, that she thought the U-turn on 45p was disappointing? Uh, I have to say, isn't this a bit like the arsonist turning up uh, to a house fire with a, fu with a bucket saying, oh, we want to help. They're the ones who started this. Well, first of all, you will know, Troy, because you've been to... You're a veteran of party conferences. <laughs> party conferences... That's a way of telling me I'm old. No. That's not going to put me off. <laughs> they, they were the two people who started this. Well, first of all, as I said, we'd been in office um, under Liz Truss uh, for a very short period of time when uh, Her Late Majesty sadly passed away and then we had to obviously coordinate and it was the honour of my life to coordinate um, the yeah. funeral and commemoration uh, for Her Majesty. Um, and, of course, we have cabinet collective responsibility, but we've literally had only, only one cabinet meeting. That hasn't stopped us doing the work. We, I have, as in my role as Chief Operating Officer, been making sure all those targets um, are now unpacked. There's um, targets by, by time and, of course, um, by milestone in place for each of those the Minister, departments. you're not dealing with this I'm gonna, point, I'm, I'm coming which to is it. about your colleagues, yes. who were the first to criticise yes. uh, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister in various ways, suddenly deciding that they're calling for unity. I mean, for goodness sake. Well, so let, let's just... be serious. Let, no, it is very serious, because actually, both Penny and Sweller uh, are part of that team, part of that cabinet. We've got cabinet collective responsibility. On the universal credit um, uh, uplift, the Secretary of State at the Department for Work and Pensions, Chloe Smith, there's a process, you know that, there's a process, the actual data from September is still not uh, fully uh, collated. The one thing I would tell your viewers is List Trust will always be on the side of helping the most vulnerable. The 8 million most vulnerable households are not only getting the advantage of the energy price cap, she's putting the average household not paying more than two, two and a half thousand pounds for their energy, but also the 1,200 pounds that we'd previously got in place that we're getting to those households. So we'll always be on the side of those households that need the most help. But until we have the process complete at DWP, no decision has been made on the universal credit, um, uh, on the benefits operating. But if I may say so, this is, this is unusual for you. You're, you're, you're still not answering my question. The two cabinet ministers who have written these articles knew all that you've just said when they went out at the Conservative Party conference and said, oh, no, we're not going to stick to the line and wait uh, until the Chancellor's decided on this benefits thing. Penny Morden said, I'm for inflation, uh, when she knew that the, uh, that the cabinet line was not to say anything. Suella Braverman, day after a U-turn, says, actually, don't think that was right. And they're now saying, calling for unity. This doesn't make any sense. When you are moving at pace and delay uh, is um, your enemy, you know, we have little time, we've got 24 months to demonstrate to the nation that we can deliver this growth plan, um, we can deliver the energy plan, we can deliver the infrastructure, the health care plan, all these things. Um, we're moving you know, incredibly right. far. If Penny was here, or Swell, as I say to you, of course we take Cabinet collective responsibility. On Sweller's point, what she was saying is this Prime Minister is focused on tax take, tax receipts coming into the exchequer to pay for the doctors and nurses and teachers and police officers that we want to see um, actually you know, delivering for this country. All right. That is you know, perfectly All sensible, right. but we have collect Cabinet collective responsibility and when we make a decision on the universal credit, on the benefits uplift, Everybody uh, will then we will it. row behind. All right, now, let's, let's talk about policy. The, uh, the Prime Minister introduced a new phrase to us last week, the anti-growth coalition. Now, I suppose that includes people who don't want building on green belts, people who don't want fracking, who, people who like their villages 
just as they are and don't want new housing estates at the bottom of, of the garden, uh, and people who think that we've had far too much uh, immigration and we shouldn't be doing any more of that. Um, those sound to me like solid Tory voters. So isn't, you, that, isn't your strategy self-destructive? You are mischievously conflating consent of the people uh, versus actual policy on delivery of a, of a dynamic economy. Why do I say that? So let's take the issue of immigration. People are absolutely right that we want to bear down on bad migration. So if you look at, say, let me give you an example, on international students. International students are a, a, a plus, a really positive thing for our uh, universities, for our communities. But if you look at the number of dependents that come with international students, you'd expect most international students may bring uh, one dependent, or if they are doing a PhD, they might bring their wife and maybe a child or two. Um, there are some uh, people who are coming to study in the UK who are bringing five, six you know, more people with them. Is that right? No, because we have to make sure that they're actually they're coming to legitimately study here. Uh, and, of course, that is the right... ..thing to do, to look at bearing down on um, abuse of the system. On the, the, the other side of, of, of yeah. that equation, uh, on the projects that we're trying to deliver, so let's look at gigabit broadband. We need more uh, engineers who can splice the yeah. actual um, uh, uh, technology together to deliver gigabit broadband. If we need another two or 300 engineers to come in to be able to do that at pace, I think people will support that. If you look at what we're doing on, you, oh, hold on, hold on yeah, what we're doing okay. on investment zones, investment zones are about local areas consenting yeah. to having an investment zone that includes you know, substantial amounts of residential building, of commercial building. That's a good thing. But, on this gas, is a, this on is a, tapping into our this, gas assets. Okay, just before you go on to that, right? Uh, this, this is a great picture you're painting. Yeah. When you say people will support that. Mm. I take one person who's not going to support it, Suella Braverman, who last week said we want to get immigration down to net, below net 100,000. Right now, it's net 239,000. She is one person who is not going to agree with the words you've just said, so honestly. I, I'm going to... I, I'll answer that in a very straightforward way, because I have a weekly meeting, um, because I chair that meeting, um, on both uh, legal migration and, of course, the illegal migration that we want to stamp out, um, including the issue around you know, small boats where people are being, um, you know, having their lives put in danger by these gangs. And we want to break that business model with Sweller uh, Braverman in those weekly meetings. Because, again, do you remember what I said to you at the beginning? Time is against us. Delay is our enemy. We have to move at pace to deliver the stuff. As okay. the chief operating officer, I do that. So well as in those meetings every week, and she would agree with me when I say to you, we have to bear down on the bad migration and okay. make sure that the economy and the big projects are going to deliver, the, uh, okay. the needs of those projects are met at speed in the next 24 months, because what Liz wants to see is not just announcements, okay. but delivery. She All wants right. to see outputs. We, we, I, when we next see her, we'll ask her if she really agrees. But let's... let's yeah. Let's not delay and let's get to the thing that I think most people will be having on their minds right now. Winter's coming, mm. energy uh, is an issue. The National Grid says that, though it's unlikely, mm. there could be planned blackouts. Do you agree with that? It's extremely unlikely. So let me, again, I, I again, Cabinet Office and my responsibilities to chair those meetings. We've got a couple of things that, that are... Um, things that we've done that help us deal with um, winter and, of course, war on our continent is the cause of um, uh, you know, us being very focused on making sure we have the resilience in place over winter. What have we got? We've got the second largest um, LNG processing infrastructure in Europe. Yeah. We've, half of our gas we produce here at home. We want to go further. This year we've increased our output by 26% on gas. Um, we've got interconnectors with our neighbours. Now, what the National Grid is saying is the extremely unlikely scenario 
where there's issues in Europe with the interconnectors. Um, and a cold snap. And a no, very cold that. snap. So, but it, but so, it's possible, isn't it? So it is extremely unlikely, but it's only right that we you know, plan for every scenario. But all I would say is we have a buffer, the same buff buffer as last year. And so I'm confident that come Christmas, come you know, the cold weather, we will continue to be in that you know, resilient place. But it's only right that we have, um, you know, we have actually looked at every scenario. Okay. Now, what the national grid is doing with Ofgem is also actually, you know, having a, a, a communication um, uh, uh, program to tell people how they can do better. We ourselves, if you go okay. on gov.uk, ah. you will be able to see um, how you can Let's... actually, um, you know, help ah, this is interesting. Your Let's... home or your business oh. can serve energy. Because... Oh, this is very interesting. So, yeah. so the, the 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 stories we've been hearing about the government saying to uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg's department, that plan that you've got for telling people how they can dial down the amount of energy that they use and so on, there will now be a government campaign and government, not direction, but uh, government information about how we can all use less energy. So the, the question you ask is about spending £14 million on a campaign. That, I think, is the wrong thing, because actually... Um, if you go on gov.uk now, you'll see, um, if you search how, you know, what tips there are for you to be able to um, conserve more energy, use energy wisely, the National Grid and Ofgem, um, and actually a number of the uh, energy providers um, are using the direct communication with households uh, to be able to say, you know, here are some measures that you can take. And so is, is it going to tell us things like done. how what, we turn down the boiler temperature? What, is it going to tell us what we ha what to we're, do what, laundry what at we're night? we're not doing is spending £14 million on oh. a government campaign. Yeah, yeah OK, you don't have to spend the money. But, um, uh, well, let me ask you. You're, yeah. You know, you're the minister for sorting stuff out, really, at the moment. Um, if I say to you, what should I be doing? Should I be doing my laundry at night? Should I... The Norwegians are telling people, shower with a friend. Uh, is that... Um, is that what you're going to be recommending? So I think, look, the, the, the really positive thing that Liz Truss has done, if you think through what she did in the first two days, is having the energy price cap where the average household will not pay more than £2,500 has two positive things. Everybody One, agrees about this. Right. Everybody agrees about this. Let me, let me just... Let we, me haven't just got, we haven't got right. all day. I just want to ask Actually, you, it helps will households. you be giving people advice yeah. about things they ought to do to re uh, reduce the amount of energy they personally use and we collectively use. So if they go on gov.uk, there's lots of advice on that. Um, and na national not Grid a specific and campaign. Gem, no, not a specific campaign. But actually, the bearing down on the cost of energy for households help people cope um, with war on our continent um, and make sure they have a safe Christmas when it comes to their energy consumption. By the way, it does one other thing, which we haven't talked about. It actually bears down on inflation up to 5% on inflation, yep. and that fiscal responsibility will help then the monetary policy, that is the Independent Bank of England, be, hopefully bring inflation back under control as well. We um, are seeing this morning images of uh, at least one half of a bridge between Russia and Crimea in the water. Um, and as you've already suggested, that is part of the problem that we're facing to do with energy and food uh, shortages potentially and so on. Is this a turning point in that war, do you think? So when I was Chancellor of the Exchequer, I worked with Janet Yellen, my opposite number, to... In the United have, States. In the United States, to get the political agreement at G7 on the oil price cap so that we don't allow Putin to profiteer from excessively high prices of oil. Um, I think Mr Putin uh, needs to end this war, and the way you end this war is by actually um, pulling your troops from all of the Ukraine um, as quickly as possible. Um, we will continue to support the Ukrainians in uh, their incredible endeavour to get their country uh, back. Ben Wallace spoke about this at party conference. The work that he is doing, that James Cleverly is doing at the uh, Department um, uh, in, in Development and, of course, aid that's going into uh, Ukraine, uh, it will continue. Um, and I think uh, there's one way to stop this war. The only way to stop this war is for Russia to withdraw from Ukraine. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Mr Putin thinks we understand that there may be another way to stop this war, at war, which is the use of nuclear weapons. And Mr Biden has said that they think that's a reali he, uh, realistic prospect. Mr Zelensky has said he thinks that's a realistic prospect. Does the British government 
think that it's a realistic prospect that Putin could use nuclear weapons? Well, Putin is unpredictable, and I will not um, wish to speculate as to um, what he does next. The right thing to do is to withdraw. Um, I think the Russian people will have something to say if he decides to give the order to use nuclear weapons on people that he claims to be his um, cousins and family. Yeah, they um, haven't had much family. of a say so far, have they? I mean, on, well, but, the, but the main point I really want to ask you is, mm. a year ago, we didn't take what he said seriously. And we didn't... We were surprised, frankly, by February 24th. It's quite the opposite. Uh, if you remember, Trevor, we were actually front-running that story, which irritated him. We, with our allies, the Americans, we were telling the world that Putin will invade, he's preparing for invasion, uh, full-scale invasion, when actually few people okay. in other parts of the world um, agreed with us. Okay, uh, I, so I think, I, I think I, it was the opposite. I won't argue the toss with you about yeah. that, but yeah. if we are so... Uh, if we know it all, what do we actually believe he is likely to do now? Will he or will he not, according to the briefings and advice that you have, be prepared to use nuclear weapons? We don't know it all. Um, we have to continue to support uh, the Ukrainians. Um, and, of course, they have to be the ones in the lead on this. Um, they're the ones who are fighting for their freedom, fighting for our freedom. Um, you know... If you go back a step, okay. Trevor, because you, 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 you know, this we is important to, to you. Brief. You remember uh, what Putin did with Assad in Syria, where there, there was that red line about using chemical weapons, and we never actually followed through, because actually it was Ed Miliband at the time, who was leader of the Labour Party, who withdrew support to Cameron on that. He then took the Crimea, and there was very little impact. Uh, now um, it is very different. Now Europe, the world's united in many ways, the free world's united, in supporting Ukraine to claim their freedom and our freedom and safety back. Nadim Zahawi, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. Now, if these are difficult times for the new government, then Labour might feel they're hitting new heights. Some opinion polls are giving them a 30-point lead over the Conservatives. An election has to be called in the next two years. So how is the party going to win back power? And while they might criticise the government, undoubtedly will, they must now convince voters that they can solve the cost of living crisis. To see what they're going to do, I'm joined by the Shadow Work and Pensions Secretary, Jonathan Ashworth. Good morning. Good morning. Um, can I just pick up what Nadim Zahawi's just mm. been saying? Uh, what is Labour's view about Putin's intentions? We, we can't know. He's right to say that Putin is unpredictable. But do you think we need to be prepared for the possibility that he could use nuclear weapons? Well, of course, we have to be prepared for all eventualities. I'm not going to speculate on the, on the mind of, uh, of Putin. I'm not remotely uh, in a position to do so. But clearly, uh, uh, we need to con continue to support Ukraine in every way that we can. We need to work internationally to ensure that pressure is continually applied uh, to Putin's uh, to Putin, and of course, yes, we have to be prepared. But look, I, I, I've heard, I've read uh, experts suggest that this may be a bluff. I mean, it's pretty serious. I'm not I'm not downplaying it remotely. But look, it's not for me to speculate on the on the psychology of All Putin right. and what he may or may not do. But obviously, we need to be prepared. All right, let, let's let's deal with psychology closer to home. <laughs> I, know you, I know you study. Um, Labour has said that it would not have proposed the uh, abolition of the 45p rate. Mm. Um, Labour has said that it will keep the 1p uh, off income tax if it comes to power. It will also keep the cap on energy bills and spend £2 billion on NHS staff. You also support the investments proposed by the Tories in skills on what they call supply side. Um, other than the windfall tax, what concrete measures would a Labour government take to deal with the economic situation that the Conservatives have not taken? Well, the economic situation is perilous at the moment because that budget three weeks ago or so wasn't just a budget which gave £45 billion worth of unfunded tax cuts disproportionately to the better off in society because there was no validation of the plans of that budget by the independent OBR. It led to turmoil on the markets, it led to guilt yields rising, it led to a run on pension funds, 
and now mortgage costs are soaring. So people coming off a, uh, off a mortgage in this year, about 1.8 million of them will be doing that in the next 12 months or so, are facing a mortgage, mortgage increase of hundreds of pounds every, every month as a consequence. So we are in a particular perilous moment because of decisions that were taken by Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng three weeks ago. It's why we've called for that kamikaze budget to be reversed, because we need to build a dynamic economy, absolutely, but we need stability in our economy. Instead, what we've got is a reckless approach, a spike in borrowing costs, and now the government, as we understand it, are talking about asking working mums and dads, disabled people, poorer pensioners, to pay the price for that recklessness. If I may say so, um, Sky viewers know all of that because we're reporting it all the time. What Sky viewers have no idea about is what you would do. So let me ask you again. What would Labour do, other than the windfall tax, which would only last a year, what would Labour do to tackle all of the problems you've enumerated that the Conservatives are not now doing? Well, actually, at our party conference just two weeks ago, we outlined how we're going to rebuild our economy, make our economy more dy dynamic, and spread prosperity and opportunity. For example, we're going to invest in the green technologies of the future. Not only because... So that... are they? No, well, they're not. The problem is they're not, are they? If they yes, were, they are, no, they're, they're not. No, they're not. No, they're not. No, they're not. They've, they've given you the numbers. No, they're going no, to no, no, they haven't. No, they haven't. And it runs into billions. No, they haven't. They've degraded our uh, uh, gas storage facilities. They've criticised solar panels in fields. I mean, I remember uh, they were refusing to go for off or onshore wind, so they're not investing in the green technology no, of the they're, future. They're not refusing and, uh, to go for offshore wind. Onshore, they, onshore, onshore, onshore. They, they haven't made a decision no, on that. Oh, come on. But anyway, no, 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 no. OK, well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell, no, I'll no, tell no, you, you're asking me a question. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm going to give you another 30 seconds no, 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 and say no, everything your you'd question. like to say we, about the Tories, no, and then let's come uh, back to uh, Labour. No, 30 seconds no, to, I don't want to tell us how bad the Tories are. I'm not talking about the Tories. I'm talking about what Labour are doing. We're going to invest in these green technologies, not only because that, because in this period of international instability... How much 20, are you going to invest? £28 billion. Pounds. OK. You know, Rachel Reeves told us that. Uh, she told me that, actually, about six months ago. OK, so what's new about the cost of living, about inflation? We're now in a different situation. You yourself have just said that. What would you do about this situation that Tories don't do? i tell you what we will do. We're going to reform our welfare system to get people back to work. The 600,000 over 50s have left the labour market since the pandemic. Those leaving the labour market for reasons of sickness is now rising at its highest rate ever and is at a 20-year high. And yet we don't have a Job Centre Plus system or a welfare system that is supporting these people to go back into work. Many of them say they will return to work if they're given the correct support to do it. And yet the government are not giving those people any support whatsoever. No, now, if you can get people back to work, no, that no, is a supply-side reform. What, which what, help... does the, what does that support look like? What is it? Is it money? Well, let me... Is it advice? What is it? Well... Some of, some of it is to do with advice and employment services. So, for example, if, if you're in your 50s and you've left the labour market, it may be that there are, you are looking for a flexible type of work. It may be that you're care, caring for grandchildren, but also caring for a loved one, a, a mum or a dad or a partner who might have uh, dementia or might have had a stroke, and you're looking for a flexible work option. At the moment, you can't walk into the job centre and ask for help to find that job for you. So I want to reform the way job centres work. I want to reform the way in which we do employment services in this country to get more people into work. And those who are currently on benefits in low paid work, I want to give them the help so they can work more hours or move into better paid jobs. So actually, we've got a big programme of reform to our social security system, which will help more people into work, which is the type of supply side reform that will actually bring inflation down stabilise the cost of living and grow our economy. All right, look, I mean, we could uh, carry on uh, about that. I'm, I'm not sure I can still quite see the difference here, but let's talk about... Well, there's about a big some... difference because the Conservative government aren't doing that. OK. And there's uh, a million vacancies okay. in the economy. Uh, uh, all I can tell you is that they will sit here and tell me that they are doing it, but let, they let's... They won't. I promise you they won't. I absolutely promise you that they won't. I've heard it. They said it. Anyway, let's talk about something that, is, that matters today. And that is the SNP have their conference. We are pretty sure that they will... Um, call for a second independent referendum. If Labour were in government, would it grant the SNP a second referendum? No. OK. Uh, the Scottish government... Let me ask you another thing, because it, it's, it is thought unlikely that uh, 
that Labour will get an out, uh, outright majority. Though looking at the polls today, that's possible. But let's just see, let's say. Uh, that the most likely outcome here is that Labour would need some support from the SNP. Um, what are your relations like right now on issues like, uh, for example, the gender recognition question? Uh, the Scots, Scottish National Party says that it plans to make it legal for an individual born with a typical male body to have their gender changed without any professional assessment or medical intervention. Um, that's what they want to do. Will Labour support that bill? Well, 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 hang on. The whole premise of your question was that Labour cannot form a majority. Now, I'm not one to pray in a opinion polls, because I believe the only opinion polls that matter is the one on election you, you've day. You've told me that before, Ale yes. On election day. But um, I'm afraid um, the premise of your question is that Labour won't get a majority. Well, the, the opinion polls are not showing that at the moment, as indeed you did concede when you asked me the question. I, I, I've, so, I've, I've acknowledged so, that. So, uh, look, look, right, we are planning, we are campaigning for, and we are hoping to win the trust of the British people to form a majority Labour government. So whatever the SNP policy is here or there or everywhere is irrelevant. We're going to form a majority Labour government in order to rebuild I... our public services, okay. in order to get well... people back to work and actually to support people right. through this cost of living Just crisis. Just to come back to my specific question, will the Labour uh, Party in the Scottish uh, Parliament vote for this piece of legislation? I mean, I presume... The, the, I mean, I don't know is the honest answer, but I presume my, my colleagues in the Scottish Labour Party uh, are, are broadly supportive of, uh, uh, of changes to support trans people who are a very marginalised group in society, a very stigmatised group in society, and have uh, 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 often but, treated but in, appallingly. But including male-bodied people going into women's refuges, for example? And women's prisons? Well, is that a specific That's what that item in the... Would allow. Well, look, my colleagues in the Scottish Labour, Labour Party in the Parliament will no doubt have opinions on this and will, will, okay. will, will, will respond. I mean, I'm, I'm not a member of the Scottish Parliament. All right, John Ashworth, thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Thank you. Now, this week, the Supreme Court will hear one of the biggest and most sensitive constitutional arguments. Should Scotland be allowed to hold a second independence referendum? The current rules mean it can only take place if the UK government agrees to a vote, as I've just been uh, talking to Jonathan Ashworth about. The SNP government in Holyrood argues that having won last year's Scottish parliamentary election, they have the right to call another ballot. Well, the opinion polls on the question of Scottish independence remain very finely balanced. So, with the cost of living crisis, can the SNP persuade Scots to their cause? We're joined by Angus Robertson from the SNP, Cabinet Secretary for the Constitution, External Affairs and Culture in Scotland. Good morning, Mr Robertson. Morning, Trevor. Thank you for joining us. Now, Nicola um, Sturgeon's complained this week that Liz Truss hasn't been in touch. Um, is that still true? I believe so, yeah. And um, just as a matter of interest, uh, why doesn't she just pick up the phone and call Liz Truss? Well, I think uh, the First Minister uh, did speak in passing to Liz Truss at the funeral for Her Majesty uh, the Queen, but it's common custom and, and practice when somebody takes up office. This is what happened with um, both uh, Boris Johnson and uh, his predecessor, that they uh, got in touch with the First Ministers of both Scotland and Wales on assuming office within days of doing so. That's what happened then, that's not what's happening now, and it's disappointing and, frankly, a bit uh, childish. Well, uh, yeah, uh, but, you know, Nicola Sturgeon's been there a lot longer than Liz Truss. Um, wouldn't it be a bit grown up for her to... She knows Liz Truss. Just ring up and say, um, when are we going to have a chat? I just told you that she did speak to her. Um, what it is... is
is at issue is that the Prime Minister, who, if you remember, made great play of uh, suggesting that she would ignore the First Minister of Scotland, is ignoring the First Minister of Scotland, is ignoring the First Minister of Wales, and that's not supposed how it's supposed to work in oh, uh, the devolved uh, okay. UK, a multinational state. We're supposed to have grown-up relations, uh, which is exactly why the First Minister did speak to the new Prime Minister at the Queen's uh, funeral. Unfortunately, the Prime Minister hasn't found time yet to speak to the First Ministers of Scotland or Wales since assuming office. Had time to speak to a lot of other people. Oh, OK. Uh, this is... Uh, forgive me, this might be a little confusing for viewers. She has spoken to her or she has not spoken to her? What, what, which is, have they spoken or have they has not? Has spoken to the... The First Minister of Scotland spoke in passing to the Prime Minister at the funeral of Her Majesty the Queen. That's what I said a moment ago. What's normal when a Prime Minister takes office is that they call um, the leaders of governments and countries with whom they have a valued relationship. That's the normal custom and practice. And the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom has not seen fit to speak to the First Ministers of Scotland or Wales at any great length since taking office, which is odd, okay. uh, given that a, a, unionist, a unionist politician who says that there's a respect agenda uh, between the UK government and the different nations of the United Kingdom uh, doesn't think that it's worth speaking to the leaders of Scotland or Wales. OK, I, OK, I, I, I understand. The point is that uh, uh, Ms Sturgeon feels she hasn't been spoken to with at the right time and with sufficient respect and uh, at same length. Now, one of the things that they could have talked about then would have been uh, the state of the economy and what you do about it together. Um, can you just make clear, what, what is the Scottish Government's point of view on the basic rate of income tax? Will it be uh, agreeing with the UK Government that the basic rate uh, should come down to 19p, which is uh, in the Scottish Government's purview? It can decide whether it goes with it or doesn't. What, what are you <coughs> going to do? So the first, so the, the, the first thing uh, that the Scottish government would do is tell the UK uh, government that it has made a huge mistake with its approach to the UK uh, economy, crashing the currency, driving debt through the roof, um, leading to uncertainty in the markets that is driving mortgage rates up, which will make mortgage payments for far too many people, the length and breadth of the UK, uh, unaffordable. So um, uh, launching a kamikaze budget at the beginning of a term of office is certainly not something that the SNP would be supporting. And from the start, we have said that, uh, especially in relation to the tax cuts to the rich, whether it's the 45p rate or whether it's the bankers' bonuses, uh, that's exactly the wrong way to go. In terms of other tax changes, Deputy First Minister uh, John Swinney um, has called together experts who will be advising him uh, with a report before the end of this month when we have to make decisions about what we will be doing with tax rates in Scotland. You're absolutely right to highlight that we do have, uh, we do have marginal um, uh, controls over taxation uh, in Scotland and at that point the right decisions would be made. But we would certainly not have been emulating uh, the very damaging approach that the uh, UK Tory uh, government has been making uh, towards the economy in Scotland and the rest of the UK. Oh, so, so if, you, if your view is that you do not want to copy what um, uh, the Trust government is doing, it is quite possible that um, come April, Scots will be paying more in income tax than everybody else in the UK. I'm sure you'd want to finish off that sentence by uh, pointing out the fact of yours and the rest of the UK that taxpayers in Scotland in general, the majority pay less tax across the piece uh, than the rest of the United uh, Kingdom. Those are the facts as they stand. We are trying to find the appropriate balance in government policy to no, make no, no, sure no, 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 no. Uh, Let's not that confuse people the total who are tax best take. able... Sorry, I didn't... Yeah, I... That... Let, just, uh, just a, OK, let me ma sorry, clarify sorry, my Trevor, question. Sorry, Trevor, you didn't, you didn't you, you, clarify. You didn't... You I'm sorry. Uh, you've responded on the total tax take. The question I really... I asked was that the individual I, I taxpayer know. in Scotland would be paying a higher basic rate than others in the UK. 
and uh, as I said, and I'm not incorrect to point this out, the majority of taxpayers in Scotland pay less tax than the rest of the United Kingdom. That is the context at the present time. I also said just a moment ago that Deputy First Minister John Swinney, who's in, in charge of the public finances at, at this present time in Scotland, is reviewing the impact of the UK government's um, mini budget to work out what the appropriate decisions should be in Scotland and will be do it on the basis of the facts unlike the UK government that has been making very damaging decisions without the advice of the Office of Budget Responsibility. We are going to make decisions about Scotland's finances in a prudent way, but there's a wider point at issue with this, Trevor, which is Scotland doesn't need to be in this situation. We don't need to have our public finances decided upon by people that we have not elected since 1955. We, of course, have another option, and we voted in favour of that in last year's Scottish Parliament election, namely to have a referendum in this country so that we can become an independent state and rejoin the European Union. I would far rather not be at the mercy uh, of Tory chancellors of the Exchequer or prime ministers who we haven't voted for. It's not sustainable and it's not sensible given everything that we've learned about their financial imprudence and their uh, belief in a Thatcherite um, economic orthodoxy which is going to cost all right. us all dearly. All right, let, let, let's move away from the things that... Um for which, as you would put it, the Tories are responsible. And let's talk about the things which you do all by yourself. So, for example, um, there's supposed to be an inquiry into COVID in Scotland. Can you tell us when that's going to start? And by the way, can you tell us why the chair and I think three um, junior count, three, four councils uh, have resigned from that inquiry? So in, in Scotland, we have a separation of powers. Government is separate from the legal system. So it's not for me to speak on behalf of um, uh, Scottish judges or Scottish advocates about an inquiry that is separate from government. You'll have to arrange uh, to speak to uh, people in Scotland's legal system for those kind of questions. Uh, we, we value the separation of government and our judicial system, and it's going to remain that way. Uh, Professor Peter Watson, who represents the families uh, of those who lost uh, loved ones, uh, says this inquiry is going nowhere. It's commissioned by the Scottish Government. Uh, surely you do have some responsibility for it. Well, I, I would wish it could um, be underway and I would wish that it would report as quickly as possible. The lessons need to be learned and, as you quite rightly say, families want answers. They deserve that. But I'm pointing out a, ba a basic fact about the, the way government and the way our judicial system works in, in this country. It's not for us to intervene in personnel decisions about independent legal inquiries. Of course, I, 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 I hope that it is up and running as quickly as possible. I hope that it can conclude as quickly as possible. Uh, and it, it's a shame that things are not underway. Those questions, though, are rightly to be addressed um, at our legal authorities, uh, who are very separate from government, and quite rightly so. And in the meantime, if there's any way that government can help, whilst protecting the independence of our, our legal system, okay. uh, to get on with the inquiry that we would all want to see conclude, we would be all happy right. to do that. All right, well, let, let, let's try and talk about something for which you and only you are responsible, which is what you say about uh, IndyRef 2. Um, the First Minister said this week that if you don't get a favourable judgment from the Supreme Court, that you will treat the general election as a vote on independence. Now, uh, some people might say that's just a tad arrogant. Uh, isn't it for the voters to decide what a general election is about? Well, well, let's just remind ourselves what the voters actually decided. And we had an election last year where this was the number one issue in the election. People voted and they uh, voted in record numbers for a pro-independence government in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, at the parties that were elected on a manifesto com commitment that the people should be able to decide in the referendum won the election and the parties but, that opposed that, the Conservatives, with, with the Labour respect, Party you weren't and in the, the Liberal Democrats, lost respect, no, it's a very, you weren't no, in the no, with greatest, booth. Trevor, you, you were in the voting booth with, the with them. How do you know that that was the number one issue for but them? The great, 
with the greatest... Well, I, I was in the middle of the election campaign. I had, I had the good fortune to win the seat uh, that Ruth Davidson previously held as the leader of the Scottish Conservative Party in Edinburgh Central. I know very well why I won that election. I know what was in my manifesto, and the people not knew what was in the SNP manifesto. I'm not going to patronise the electorate. The electorate uh, voted for a pro-independence majority in the Parliament, and to simply do as if that doesn't matter, um, frankly, is not good enough in, in a democracy. And when you have guests on programmes and ask them whether they will respect democratic election results, to simply pass on from it when they, they say, no, we're not going to respect a democracy, is frankly slightly odd in my view. It is remarkable how UK political parties that lost the election Scotland in this issue are given a pass on this. Either we live in a democracy or we don't. The people have voted to have the right to choose. And in a democracy, the people should be able to choose. They can vote yes, they can vote no, but surely they should have the right to choose. We can solve this issue very simply because we managed to do it in the run-up to 2014. The UK government respected the election result in Scotland. They passed what was called a Section 30 order, and we were able to hold a referendum in Scotland. There is no impediment to this happening. The fact that we've had okay. to go to the Supreme Court, the fact that we're having to invoke the possibility of using elections uh, to yet again again, show that people want to choose on this country's future is not where we need to be. I'd far rather the UK government just respected the Scottish electorate, respected the, um, the election results okay. in the majority of the Scottish Parliament, and as good Democrats, as Democrats, abide by democratic standards. Unfortunately, the Conservatives, okay. and now sadly also okay. the Labour Party, are perfectly happy to discard Scottish democracy, and it's not good enough. OK. Angus Robertson, thank you so much for, for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. Now, train services across the country are returning to normal this morning, but already other key workers are threatening widespread strike action. The Royal College of Nursing has sent ballot papers to 300,000 members across the UK, the largest vote it's ever called. The college says that nurses are understaffed, undervalued and underpaid. With us this morning is Pat Cullen, the RCN's General Secretary and Chief Executive. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, before we talk about the strike, where have, we actually, where have you actually got to in the negotiations? Um, well, put simply, um, we aren't in negotiations. I have made many attempts on behalf of not just the 300,000 nurses that have been balloted, but the 500,000 plus nurses that I represent. And unfortunately, this government hasn't engaged with the Royal College of Nursing as yet. When you say they haven't in, engaged, and, and uh, do you mean that you've asked for a meeting and um, whoever happened to be health secretary at the time said, no, I'm not talking to you? Well, the last uh, health secretary that I'd contact with was Sajid Javid. And since then, we have made multiple attempts to try and engage with the health secretary. Um, the two, uh, the current one and the previous one that was very short lived. Uh, and both of those people have not um, as yet met with the Royal College of Nursing. Uh, but presumably, the, the actual employer here, anyway, is not Therese Coffey, who's now the health secretary, but the NHS. Presumably, you are talking to NHS, NHS managers. Of course, we're talking and, to And where have you got to with them? Well, well, of course, the NHS managers will say very clearly to me that it's not within their gift to um, negotiate with me on pay for their employees, which are our nurses. Uh, so I'm bounced back to government. And that's right. That's absolutely right. Those employers do not have the authority uh, to actually negotiate because Agenda for Change sits at, um, which is the pay framework for our nursing staff, sits within the domain of government to make those decisions. What, um, what is it that you want? Um, what, what is your so -so central demand? Well, first of all, for nurses to be paid a fair and decent wage. That's what we're asking for. And our ask is 5% above the rate of inflation. That's very clear. It's not about nurses um, being greedy. Uh, it's not about wanting the same um, preferential treatment that was given to the bankers and others by this government. We're asking for them to be paid a fair and decent wage so that we can retain them in the health service looking after our patients. Well, um, let's leave the bankers aside, because they're not paid by the government, they're not paid by the taxpayer. 
5% uh, above inflation this morning is 14.9%. That's quite a hefty rise. Well, Trevor, you did mention the bankers, but if you looked and, um, of course, we attended the Conservative Party conference and we listened very carefully to what they say, and it does seem that those people, like bankers and others, are very carefully looked after. What we have seen very clearly from this government is that they haven't managed to actually recognise that they cannot have a health service without nurses. We heard this morning from ministers coming on this programme and talking about how they're going to deliver on their A's, their B's, their C's and their D's. And what I want to say to each and every one of them, they'll deliver on none of those if they do not understand there's an N in the alphabet, because each one of those depend on nurses. We deliver nothing in health and social care without having a nurse. And yet they have just seemed to not understand that they need to understand that there's an N in the alphabet and they need to respect nurses if they want to retain them in the health service. If we can stop our nurses having to leave the health service and indeed social care to find jobs in supermarkets, in restaurants and other places so that they can pay their bills. I think that's an incredible indictment on any minister to sit here and not actually recognise what they are doing to the health service and to patients. Do you, um, are you getting any more mileage, if I can put it that way, from...